الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ask Allah to make this uh, another book that we can study and get closer to Allah with and that he blesses us in our sittings and that he accepts it from us and gives us the ability to act upon it and that he takes us in a situation where he is pleased with us and not angered. Uh, starting a new book today, Bi'ithnillah, the well-known book, uh, like Uncle just said, they give it out. There's been a lot of uh, support behind this book. And it's a book that is well-known to all of us and it's been translated into English also. And in Arabic... The title of the book is Hisnul Muslim. And the author, Rahimahullah, who's just passed away recently, is Saeed ibn Ali ibn Wahf al Qahtani. And before we start, traditionally the ulama give a little bit of experience and a little bit of background about who the, the author is. So I think it's befitting that we carry on with that tradition so that we can know. Uh, who it is that has authored this book and we can see his relationship and the effort that he's put into it. So his name, like we've said before, is Sheikh Saeed ibn Wafiq He was born in 1371 Hijri and he passed away this year, Muharram, uh, 1440. Uh, he grew up living in the desert. He was a nomad, he was a Bedouin. And for his very early days, he was a shepherd four or five years old, moving onwards. He was actually a shepherd and he used to look after sheep. And he actually started seeking knowledge at the age of 15 years old. And after that, Allah gave him barakah and tawfiq until he graduated and he continued seeking knowledge until he graduated from Imam Muhammad ibn Saud University in Riyadh in 1404. Uh, from the faculty of Usul al-Din. And later he went on to study and he got his magister, he got his MA and he got a PhD. Uh, whilst he was studying at the university, he had a very strong and close relationship with Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz. And he says about himself that he started studying with the Sheikh in 1400. So that was 40 years ago with Sheikh Ibn Baz, rahimahullah, in Riyadh. And the Sheikh used to give a lot of durus while he was alive. Uh, many extensive uh, collections of books. And this is some of the things that he went through with Ibn Baz, rahimahullah, Musad Ahmad, which is about 40 volumes. The Muwatta Imam Malik, the Sunnah of Imam Darimi. Uh, including the books of Imam Muhammad ibn Wahhab, ibn Taymiyyah, and ibn Qayyim. May Allah have mercy on all of them. And he said he continued studying with Ibn Abbas from 1400 until he passed away in 1420. Sheikh Ibn Abbas, this is the 20th year that this Ummah has been without him. And the Sheikh, throughout his studying life also, he attained three different ijazas in reciting the Qur'an. Three different ijazas in reciting the Qur'an. And then he became the imam and the khatib of a local masjid in southern Riyadh, where he used to hold regular durus, and he authored over 20 books, and this being arguably the most famous and possibly the most important to this ummah in this generation of ours, to be honest. And he passed away, like we said, this Muharram, after a long battle with cancer. And in this book, like we've said before, I mean, this book has had a personal impact on me, and I believe everyone's got some kind of relationship with this book. And this is why we have chosen this book, Hisnul Muslim, because I don't think, and Allah knows best, that ever since the books of Imam Muhammad ibn al Wahhab, that there's been a greater impact in any kind of book, in any different genre, within the authentic Islam more so than this book over the last 20 or 30 years, maybe even more than that if we go back. 
uh, this book, like we've said, has changed many people's lives. It's been translated into tens of different languages. And this man, like we have seen, has taken what he has studied from these different ulama, from the books of hadith, and he's compiled it for us, so it has become easy for us. And this is a tradition that the ulama of the past have done also. Imam al nawi has a book of Athkar, who is a famous muhaddith. Ibn Taymiyyah has Kalim al Tayba, who is also a famous muhaddith. And his student also, uh, Ibn Qayyim, has a book similar to this, Wabl al Sayyib. And all of it is extracted from hadith and ayat, so that we can have a book here of just Athkar and dua, which will enable us to be protect ourselves and get closer to Allah through them. And this man, rahimahullah, has been a cause of a lot of people benefiting from the sunnah and the kitab in their lives and applying athkar and dua which are sahih. And how many people has he taught to seek refuge from the punishment of the grave and prepare for death? by following Iman and following the Sunnah correctly. So we ask Allah that he doesn't deprive Sheikh Saeed the reward of teaching those people the punishment of the grave and may Allah enlighten his grave and make it a place of bliss for him. Just like he has helped many other people seek, seeking and supplicating this favor for themselves. So that's a little bit about the author, Sheikh Saeed, rahimahullah, and the book he entitled is Hisnul Muslim. And Hisn, in the Arabic language, refers to something that you would use as a fortress, or a fortification, I believe is translated as also. Uh, a barrier, a blockade, uh, a shield, even. And the reason why is because of the hadith in uh, Jami' Tirmidhi, where Allah Jalla wa Ala, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Allah Jalla wa Ala commanded Yahya ibn Zakariya, Yahya ibn Zakariya, the Prophet, the son of a Prophet, to tell Bani Israel to do five things. And from them he mentioned sadaqah, and from them he mentioned different actions. But one of them, he said, وَآمُرُكُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ كَثِيرًا And I command you to remember Allah a great deal. And he said, why? وَإِنَّ مَثَلَ ذَلِكَ The example of this, كَمَثَلْ رَجُلْ is like a man who is being chased by an enemy. And that enemy is chasing him siraan on his back. He's not leaving him. And he's right behind him, fi athari. So this man who is running away, fa'ata hisnan. He comes to a fortress. Hasinan, and he is fortified. So this man is being chased by an enemy. He finds a palace, he finds a fortress, he finds a blockade. And that blockade is extremely fortified. So then what he does is he hides in that fortification. This is the parable. There is nothing that is going to protect a person from his sworn enemy except the dhikr of Allah Ta'ala. <coughs> Therefore, this book is a protection for you and it's a salvation for you and what is within the context of this book. And then it's for the Muslim. So we have Hassan, which is a fortification, and the Muslim. What is Islam? Islam is to submit to Allah. It's the Islam lillah bit tawheed. To submit to Allah with His oneness, affirming His oneness in tawheed, in the lordship, in worship, and in His names and attributes and the rights that He has over us. 
If a person does this, is he a Muslim? Yes, Tawheed, is he a Muslim? Trick question. A person says, I, must, I submit to Allah, la ilaha illallah. Is he a Muslim? Yes. That's it? That's all he needs to do? No. That's not the full definition of Islam. That's one aspect. That's one aspect. So a person can say, yes, I'm a Muslim. La ilaha illallah. But the definition continues, وَإِنْقِيَادْ ala amri. That he must fulfill what Allah has commanded him with. He will not be a true Muslim or a full Muslim or a complete Muslim or even a Muslim until he comes with certain actions. And some of these actions, if he doesn't do them, it doesn't matter if he says he's a Muslim, he will not be a Muslim. Is that enough? He said, La ilaha illallah, and he's holding the pillars of Islam. Is that enough? No. Why? What's missing? Is he not completing Muhammad Rasulullah? No, he says, I submit to Allah, I say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. I complete, I believe in Allah, I submit to him, and I follow the Messenger, I believe in him, and I will do everything they've told me to do. Stay away from what? Yeah, he follows the arkan. In Qiyad Amri, he's done everything. In Qiyad Amri, he's followed everything that Allah and His Messenger have told him to do. Is that enough? He believes. He is to Islam. He's submitted to Allah and His Messenger. And he has Tawheed. It's to Islam, Rilabit Tawheed. And he's done everything they've told him good character and all these things. Wa bara min shirk wa ahli. He has to negate shirk for himself. This is Islam. Any one of these pillars missing, then the person hasn't perfected his Islam. Or it could be that he's not even an Islam, he's not even a Muslim at all. So this book here is for those people who have these characteristics. Those who want to submit to Allah, Jalla wa'ala. Follow the messenger that has been sent to them as a Huda and a Noor. To follow all of the commandments, whether they are obligatory or recommended, or whether they are optional. This is all included in Qiyad ala Amri. Wa bara min shirk wa ahli. And some of the actions in here will help you repel shirk from your life and the practices of the people of shirk. So this book here. The Sheikh has authored here and he says Hisnu Muslim is the title of the book Min Athkar Kitabu Sunnah And that's the full title of this particular book And to understand what dhikr is We have to know what dua is And dua is of two types Dua is of two types Dua which is known as dua al-mas'ala If you have an issue, if you have a need if you have a desperation, maybe you are happy, but you want it to increase. This is all dua Muslim. Anything that you want from Allah, all of this is dua of asking. But dua can only be dua if there are certain characteristics. Again, a person can say, I'm a Muslim. As we have seen, he might not necessarily be a Muslim. A person can say he's making dua, but he might not necessarily actually be making dua. Imam Khattabi said, Ma'na dua, the meaning of dua, is to seek or the abd, istada'a abd rabbahu azza wa jal al inaya. A slave seeks something from his Lord with attention and with need. And وَحَقِيقَتُهُ And its reality and what it actually is, dua الْإِفْتِقَارِ إِلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى Is to show submission and subservience and humility and need and desperation to Allah وَهُوَ سِمَةُ الْأُبُودِيَّةِ And this is the absolute peak and pinnacle of all kinds of worship so what we learn from this, Allah says in the Quran also, وَيَدْعُونَنَا رَغَبًا وَرَحَبًا وَكَانُوا لَنَا خَاشِئِينَ 
that the companion that the prophets have been described in supplicating to Allah balanced between hope and fear with a level of submission. This is what dua is. So unfortunately you find many people they're making dua and they're looking around and then they just wipe their hands over their face and they go. Or many people are making dua and they're having a conversation at the same time. Many people are making dua and they're thinking about something which is completely irrelevant. Maybe even something which is haram. When they're in the salat, that is the pinnacle of ubudiyah, as the Imam Khattabi said. And so a salat is one of the practical actions of dua. So this is clearly now something that we need to understand because many people complain, they say, well, our dua is not accepted and, you know, and practically they behave as if there is nothing to make dua to because they've asked and they weren't responded to, so they have, they leave Islam or they become weak in their iman and they seek their provisions and their satisfaction and other things besides Allah. But the fault is actually with them. They don't come to Allah with hope. They don't come to Allah with fear. They don't come to Allah with submission and subservience. So this is the first type of dua. Dua mas'ala. Dua of asking of Allah Jalla wa'ala. The second type of dua is known as dua al-ibadah. And dua al-ibadah is not when you are asking Allah, but it's a dua and it's a supplication that you are making, which is just purely a form of worship. For example, in salah. in salah, for example, statement, Alhamdulillah. Did you ask Allah anything? No, but it's still a dua. <coughs> Prophet ﷺ said in Tirmidhi, Khair dua Alhamdulillah. The best of dua is to say Alhamdulillah. Subhanallah, Allahu Akbar. All of this is part of what is called dua. But it's the second one. You are not asking. It's not dua mas'ala. It's dua ibadah. And another way of saying dua ibadah is dhikr. And this is why we have this book here. So what is dhikr? Dhikr consists of asking Allah Jalla wa'ala for a mas'ala, for an issue that you have. But dua is also dhikr. But now what is dhikr now? Because dhikr is also a terminology that people use, but what does it mean? Ulama have said, dhikr is anything that reminds you of Allah Jalla wa'ala. Anything that reminds you of Allah Jalla wa'ala. It could be internal. It could be external. You look at a cloud and it looks big like a mountain. You think, subhanAllah, that's dhikr. You're driving your car and it starts raining. You think, subhanAllah, that's dhikr. Anything. Now this is very important now because when we're trying to teach our children, when we're trying to t- t- teach people to take Islam seriously, they think that... This man, he's backward, or this man is boring. He wants me to come to the masjid and pray. I haven't got time for that. That's not what Islam wants. Islam wants you to do some of these things. Yes, you need to come to the masjid. You need to pray. But your life can be acts of worship, even when you are eating and drinking, as we will see, even when you are relaxing with your family. All of this could be dhikr. You talk to each other about Islam. You talk to each other about instilling good. And even, might not even be mentioning the name of Allah. Something that you have learned from a dars something you have picked up, something that you read from the Qur'an, and it's a good moral, it's a good etiquette, and you tell them, why don't you smile? Why don't you not shout? Why don't you speak nicely? Why don't you help one another? All of this is dhikr. If you do it for the sake of Allah, anything that reminds you of Allah is dhikr. This could be internal, it could be external. It could be speech, it could be an action. Therefore, people are prevented from dhikr. Because of the lack of knowing what dhikr is and the lack of ikhlas. The more a person is sincere towards something, the more they will want to get closer and understand it and get an attachment with it. Why do they make dhikr of Allah? Because they don't have that strong ikhlas. We're not saying they don't have any ikhlas, but that strong ikhlas is not there. The anbiya and the rusul as we see in their lives and as we will see from some of the athkar of the Prophet ﷺ, every single moment of his life there was something that he had to say about Allah Jalla wa'ala. That shows you that he was overly sincere to his Lord. Therefore he remembered him a great deal. What happens? Your iman goes up. Your ihsan goes up. You become good to people. You can't make dhikr and be bad to people. 
You can't make dhikr and have bad manners. You can't make dhikr and say bad things and do bad things. You can't make dhikr and smoke a cigarette and listen to music at the same time. It's possible. Nobody would do that. Nobody with the right mind. Dhikr increases your iman and your ihsan. But it has to start with yourself with ikhlas. And wanting to know who Allah is, Jalla Sheikh Sa'id, rahimahullah, began this treatise by saying, Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inu wa nasta'gfiru, and the Qutbah al Hajj, which continues. And in his, in his introduction, he said that this actual book that you have here is actually something which he took out of a bigger book that he previously wrote. And I don't think that's translated in English. It's taken from a book which he has called Dhikr wa Dua wa Ilaj bir Ruqya. Or bir ruqa min kitab sunnah. Dhikr wa dua wa ilaj bir ruqa min kitab sunnah. If anybody has seen the Arabic, it's a green cover and it's bigger than this one. And it's a book of ruqya, and it's a book of dhikr and different supplications, not just dhikr. Dhikr, which is, or dua, which is mas'ala, as well as dua, which is ibadah. But this is actually a abridgment of that. So that, the Sheikh said, so that. I have you know, abrogate, or abridged it So I have Different chapters of Athqar So it becomes easy for people to put it in their pocket Travel and And use it so that they can use These Athqar in their daily lives you can keep it next to your bed Until you go to sleep at night It's very easy, it's accessible And the Sheikh said that this Abridgment here, he is just keeping the athqar and not mentioned the full hadith. And he said that he has put them in the footnotes. And I don't know if they, you have it in the English, I'm not sure. But in this Arabic version that I have, the footnotes are there and it gives us the exact reference. And the Sheikh is saying here, if you want to know more, because he wants to keep it short and easy for people to understand, if you want to know more, the referencing is also there. So then he ends his introduction by making. Dua wa asallallahu azza wa jalla bi asma'i al husna wa sifat al ula that I ask Allah by His lofty names and His beautiful attributes, and yajalahu khalisan li wajhi al karim that He makes this sincere, sincere effort for Allah. And you can see that bi idnillah that this has been accepted. He wrote this introduction 1409, 31 years ago. For 31 years, even whilst He was alive, people would benefit. He translated. In many languages, East to West people, people are memorized from this book. And now we are studying it, I believe, only for the first time in English language after the Sheikh has passed away. And he, bi'idhnillah, as he says, wa ayyan fa'ani bihi fi hayati wa ba'd al mamati. And I ask Allah that He benefits me through this book and this effort whilst I'm alive and after I pass away. I ask Allah that He fulfills this for Him. Wa ayyan fa'ani. وَيَنْفَعَ بِهِ مَنْ قَرَأَهُ أَوْ تَبَعَهُ أَوْ كَانَ سَبَبٌ فِي نَشْرِهِ And that he supplicates for the person who reads it, us, who prints it, and who distributes it. And he ends his introduction by sending peace and blessings of the Prophet ﷺ. This is his introduction, and then the Shaykh, I don't know if you have it because there's different versions in the English. He gives a couple of pages here, very brief Reminders as to the importance of dhikr And this is what we will take today So he says Fadl al-dhikr What is dhikr and its benefits and its virtues Again we have seen that dhikr is anything that reminds you of Allah And here in this chapter here He mentions its virtues through the different ayat and the hadith That have been narrated About its importance And about how it can make you a better person and protect you Qala ta'ala فَاذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرُكُمْ وَاشْكُرُولِي وَلَا تَغْفُرُونِ If you remember me, Allah Jalla wa is saying, فَاذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرُكُمْ If you remember me, I will remember you. And if you give thanks to me, or give thanks to me and don't be ungrateful. Now what we learn from this ayah, Allah Jalla wa is saying is, if you remember him, he will remember you. Your Lord from above His Arsh, Allah, the uncreated, the perfect, the majestic, with full splendor. He doesn't need to remember you. But you remember Him, He will remember you. He will say your name. He will talk about you. 
and the angels around them, around him, Jalla wa ala, will know who you are. Some of the ulama of the Salaf have said, how many people are here in the dunya? Nobody knows about them. Majhulun fil ard wa ma'roon fil sama. They are well known, they are famous in the heavens. Salman al-Farsi has said that when a person makes dua and he supplicates and makes dhikr of Allah Jalla wa ala, those angels are there with him and they take it up to Allah Jalla wa ala. And when you make dua and when you make dhikr, those angels say, Hada sawtu ma'roof. This is a well-known voice. This is our friend. We know who this person is. Let's take it. But when a person is in need, throughout all his life he's not really remembered Allah, but now he needs something. He makes dua and says, who is this voice? We've never heard it before. You take it up, but what's going to happen? If you have no connection in making dhikr of Allah, then he won't remember you. The angels won't know who you are. You'll be unknown in the heavens. This is one thing that is quite obvious from this, from this ayah. But what is also mentioned by some of the Mufassiru and some of the Salaf is that it's only a hard heart that cannot remember Allah. And the hardness of your heart will affect your level of remembering Him. And the harder the heart becomes, the lesser they remember Allah. I was in a hospital recently and this person was told that they were about to die. And the monitor was looking very, very bad. The doctor is a Muslim doctor. He came and he said, you might want to call your family and start making arrangements. So now we are very confused. People were crying. And I said to one family member, go and remind them to say, La ilaha illallah. Remind them to remember Allah. This is their only chance now. They haven't prayed for a very long time. Forget all of that. If they die in a good state, then hopefully there's some chance. They went to them and said, say, La ilaha illallah. They said, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm just in so much pain, give me some medicine. If your heart is hard, you can't remember Allah Whilst you are healthy, whilst you are able, whilst you can't give washkuruli wala takfurun, give thanks to me and don't become arrogant, don't become ungrateful. The kufr here is referring to ungratefulness, hardness. It's only a hard heart that can't remember Allah, and the harder the heart becomes, the less they will remember. Then the Shaykh brings another ayah, you alladina amanuthkuru Allah dhikran kathira. Allah is telling us to be of those people who make dhikr. Question, who are the people of dhikr? Allah says in the Quran, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلِ الذِّكْرِ Ask the people of dhikr if you don't know. So the ulama have said that these are the people of ilm and the people of actions. Otherwise Allah would have said, أَسْأَلُوا أَهْلِ الْإِلْمِ or Utul al ilm or something like that. Ask the people who have been given information. That's not what Allah Jalla wa says. Ask Fasalu Ahl al Dhikr. Now that Allah has been calling them Ahl al Dhikr. Why? Because they have ilm and they have actions. And the ulama of Tafsir have said the reason why Allah calls them Ahl al Dhikr is because they are the ones who understand the Wahi. They are the ones who act upon the Wahi. They are the ones who are able to remind other people about the wahi. They make dhikr in themselves and they can enable other people to make dhikr of Allah Jalla wa ala. This is all dhikr. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu thkuru Allah dhikrin kathir. All you who believe, remember Allah a great deal. Be the people of dhikr. Allah Jalla wa ala says also telling us to be the people. وَالذَّاكِرِينَ Allah كَثِيرًا وَالذَّاكِرَاتِ The male people who remember Allah a great deal and the female ones who remember Allah. Allah a great deal, what happens to them? Allah has prepared for them a forgiveness, a concealment, a protection from the fire. And on top of that, negation. Now the affirmation, وَأَجْرًا azima. Plentiful reward, plentiful, you can't even imagine. Allah says, وَذْكُرْ رَبَّكَ فِي نَفْسِكَ تَدَرَّعُ وَخِيفَةً Remember Allah in yourself with humility and fear. Wadun al-jahr. Don't make it loud. Don't be proud. 
من القول بالقدو ولا صال ولا تكون من الغافلين the people of dhikr are those people who are negligent the people who don't have dhikr are the people who are negligent remember allah with subserviency remember allah with fear don't be arrogant in your voice don't harm other people with your voice do it in the morning early morning do it in the late afternoon and don't be of those people who are negligent this is dhikr of the statement but ibn muflih rahimahullah one of the, state, the students of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah So that the people of dhikr They make these adhkar morning and evening But they have certain qualities and characteristics that you can benefit from He's telling us That the people of dhikr, when you look at them You can benefit from them How? He said number one They have good manners The people of dhikr are upright in their manners They come to you with a nice and pleasant face they are good in their speech. They are from the most kindest of people. They lower their gaze. They are pleasant in their voice when they speak. And they are those who are able to weigh up the situation between good and bad. Is there a greater good? Is there a bad? Is this the right time? And some of the ulama, rahimahullah, said that some of the salaf actually used to say, sorry, some of the Salaf used to say that whenever people met Imam Ahmad, that they used to remember Allah, after seeing Imam Ahmad, they used to remember Allah for one month. They used to be remembered and reminded of Allah for one month. They had a sitting in the majlis with Imam Ahmad from his character, from his voice, from his speech, from his pleasantness, from his generosity, from his ilm, from his actions, just by being there and seeing him, they were able to benefit from a man who had dhikr, and they were in a sitting of dhikr, and they took that away from them, with them, and they were able to instill dhikr with themselves, with Allah, for one whole month. These are the people of dhikr, and this is what Allah Jalla wa ala is telling us to be. You do this, male and female, equality here. There's no... Prejudice, Allah will prepare for you a concealment, a barrier between you and the hellfire and his anger, and he will prepare for you a multiple of reward. And he will make you from those who are not negligent. What happens if you're not negligent? Your heart will open. You will remember Allah. You'll be given insight, you'll be given wisdom, you'll be given ilm, you'll be given actions, you'll be given these good manners. That our ulama had. Then the Shaykh brings some hadith. He says, وَقَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ مَثَلُ الَّذِي يَذْكُرُ الرَّبَّهُ وَالَّذِي لَا يَذْكُرُ الرَّبَّهُ مَثَلُ الْحَيِّ وَالْمَيْتِ The one who remembers Allah and the one who doesn't remember Allah. The parable and the comparison between them both is that the one who remembers Allah is like the one who is alive. And the one who doesn't remember Allah is like the one who has passed away. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah said, Many people are walking on the face of this earth and their bodies are a coffin for their dead souls. Inside, it's finished. There's no dhikr, there's no mention of Allah, they don't know their purpose, they don't know anything. They're just driven by their desires, they're just driven by whatever they want, something looks good, they go for it. Something's going to taste nice, something's going to look nice, hear nice. This is all they want. Such a person has no substance in his life. But the one who is alive and his body is not a coffin, his body is uh, a tool for his soul to remember Allah and get closer to Him. These are the people who are truly alive. Shall I tell you about the best of your deeds that you can do? You wake up and what's the best thing that you can do? The Prophet said, Shall I tell you? And the one that is most beloved to your king. And through this you will become elevated in your station in Jannah. 
is better than you if you had mountains of gold and silver that you spend it day and night. It will raise your rank. Allah loves it and will talk about it and will boast about it. It will raise your rank. It's the best of your deeds and it's better for you than spending day and night in gold and silver. وَخَيْرٍ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَن تَلْكُوا أَدُوَّكُمْ فَتَدْرِبُوا أَعْنَاكُمْ that, they, that you meet and you have a battle with your enemy and they strike yours وَيَدْرِبُوا أَعْنَاكُمْ and you strike theirs or the other way around. So the companion said, tell us, yes, what are the best of these deeds? Prophet ﷺ said, ذِكْرُ Ta'ala." And he also said, يَقُولُ اللَّهِ تَعَالَىٰ أَنَا عِنْدَ ذَنِّ أَبْدِي بِي I am as my servant has said of me. I am as my servant has said of me. Now, Allah Jalla wa'ala in his hadith Qudsi says, If he remembers me, I will remember him. If he remembers me in a gathering, I will remember him in a gathering which is better. If he comes to me by a handspan, I will come to him with an arm span. If he comes to me walking, I will come to him running. Now, I'm sure you've had this hadith before. The, the beginning bit, I am like the servant thinks of me. Your Lord, Jalla wa'ala, didn't need to create you, but he created you from a single cell. Then he protected you and he gave you skin and he gave you bones and he put you into this earth with peace and security. Then every single day he looks at you and he says, is he going to remember me so I can remember him? But we turn away. But there's still hope. He still has hope in you. He still has patience with you. He gives you water. I give him water. Imagine there's a a slave and a master. The master wants you to remember him. So he goes, here, have this water. Let me see how you're going to react. Are you going to remember me? Are you going to thank me? You drink the water? No appreciation. Okay, let me give him some food. Is he going to remember me? Then he calls you to pray. Many people, they don't pray. I'm waiting here. I'm calling you. I'm the one who created you. I'm the one who continues to give you life. What I'm telling you is to come here few minutes, talk to me so I can talk to you back, remember me so I can remember you back, remember me so I can have mercy on you so when you leave, you'll leave better, and because you remembered me, I will promise to protect you come don't come when he does come once a week, Yom Al-Jumma he comes, Allah Jalla wa'ala on that day is multiple in rewards, multiple the angels come down and they listen to the khutbah Jalla wa'ala. Say for example, you take that Friday as an example. He continues to look. The Prophet ﷺ said, when you are standing in salah, you are standing conversing with your Lord and he is watching you. And he becomes close. And when you say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, he boasts. Say, look. He says to the angels, look, look, look. This person, he's just praised me. When you make sujood, when you make ruku, he's looking at you. What do you want? What do you want? I can give it to you. I can give it to you. Subhanahu Rabbi. As quick as you can. Quickly. Let's get out. Let's finish this. Many of us just pray not having this dhan abdi bi, this dhan of Allah Jalla wa'ala. Most of us just pray so that Allah doesn't punish us. Come here, Monkey. Oh, Allah, I prayed, Dhuhr. You asked me, I prayed. Allah is sitting there in front of you, or standing there. He's in there in front of you, not sitting. He's there in front of you and he's asking. Remember me. You make sujood, and the Prophet ﷺ said that this is the closest that a person can ever be to his Lord. What does that mean? Allah Jalla wa'ala now, in that situation, is ready to give to you. He's listening. He's looking. Is he going to ask? I can say yes. Is he going to ask? I'll say yes. What does he want? All he wants is Subhan Rabbi Lala, Subhan Rabbi Lala, Subhan Rabbi Lala, Allah. He just wants to go. But that's not for the people of Dhikr. I am like the one that he has good thoughts of me. If you have good thoughts of me, 
and you remember me, I will remember you. You make this. Why are you making tasbih, brother? What's the, well, it's not a salah. You don't want to just make this. Why are you just making tasbih randomly? It doesn't make it. What are you doing? One of the mashayikh in Riyadh, people came up to ask him a question. He goes, Go away, I'm reciting the Quran. You know what they said to him? They said to him, You just recite the Quran, you can do it afterwards. He goes, I don't want to ask any of your questions. If I can't understand the Quran, have time to remember my Lord, how am I going to benefit myself, let alone benefit other people? This is your capital. I am with him if you remember. If you don't remember him and if you're just remembering enough to save yourself so that there is no hujja, there is no proof against you, Yom Qiyamah, then there is a big problem. وَأَنْ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ بِنْ بُسْرِ On the authority of Abdullah ibn Busr who said that a man said, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam إِنَّ الشَّرَاءِ الْإِسْلَامِ قَدْ كَثُرَةَ لَيَّ There are too many things in Islam for me to do. You told me to do this, you told me to do this. It's too much. فَأَخْبِرْنِي بِشَيْءِ Tell me about something that if I was to do it, I will be successful. Just one comprehensive thing. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا يزال لسان رطبا في ذكر الله. And I think we took this in the hadith of, of Nawawi. But what we learn from this also is that dhikr, like we've seen before, that is a protection for yourself. Uh, some of the ulama Okay Prophet Sallallahu said Man qara'a harfan min kitab Allah Whoever recites a word From the book of Allah Falahu bihi, falahu bihi hasana You recite one word You get a reward But what is that reward? Well hasan to bi ashri amthaliha And that one reward will be multiplied by ten La aqul alif la mim Harf I don't say Alif Lam Mim is one word or one letter. Alif is a letter, Lam is a letter, and Mim is a letter. So when you say Alif Lam Mim, how much reward do you get? Three. 30. Each one is one, and you multiply it by 10. Some of the ulama have said that when you recite that one word, it becomes multiplied by 10, but it could also be multiplied more than that. How many letters are there in the Qur'an? What do you think? More. Roughly. There's about 6,000 ayat. 300,000 letters in the Qur'an. Times it by 10. 3 million. We recite this book, 3 million. And you imagine some people do this every week. Some people do this every three days. Some of the, the Salaf used to do this twice a day. This is where the richness is. Uh, based on this hadith also, and based on what the Prophet ﷺ said, La al min dhikrillah, that you continue making your remembrances of Allah, is that the majority of ulama have said that it's better for you to recite the Qur'an, despite this reward, in a slow manner. In a slow manner, so that it will enable you to ponder on its meanings. And why these ayat are connected? Why does Allah talk about this one Nabi and then another Nabi? Why is Allah talking about this topic and then talks about another topic? Why does Allah talk about women and hayd and then talaq and then <coughs> talut? And then riba soon after and sadaqah. So pondering will enable you to benefit from the kalam of Allah. Some of the ulama have said no. Based on these dalil here, la izal lisan, make your tongue moist. Each letter and each harf is times ten. Recite it fast. And the faster you recite, the more rewards that you get. And this is the objective. But the correct opinion, bi'ibnillah, is to ponder and to learn. And that multiplication of ten doesn't apply to English or any other translation, but there is a huge reward. To the extent that the ulama, some of them have said that a person who is able to ponder in his own language, 
may be rewarded not because of reciting, but because of the level of pondering that he can gain than if he had read the Qur'an, or other people reading the Qur'an without pondering. وَأَنْ أُخْبَتَ إِبْنِ آمِرَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ أَنْ قَالْ خَرَجَ رَسُولَ اللَّهُ وَنَحْنُ فِي الصُّفَّةِ And these are the people of Sufa who are extremely poor, and they used to stay in the masjid. So the Prophet ﷺ went out one day, and whilst we were there in the masjid at the back, and the Prophet ﷺ said, who of you, extremely poor people, would like to go to a place called Bathan or another place called Aqiq? And these places is where camels used to be sold. Any one of you, really poor people, a person is really poor, destitute, is in food bank right now, you go to him and say, would you like to come with me to the Bentley showroom or to the Porsche showroom? Which one would you like? Would you like to do that? So then... You can bring back something and it will not be any difficult. There will be no hardship and there will be no family quarrels or anything. Don't worry, just go and get the thing and you can come back. Of course we want that. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Don't let any of you go to the masjid or any of you except that you go to the masjid and you learn the Qur'an. And then you recite two ayat from the Kitab of Allah Azza wa Jal. Then this is better than you gaining two of those cars. Go to the masjid, learn one ayah. It's better than a Porsche. Learn another ayah. It's better than two Porsches. Learn three ayat. It's better than three Porsches. Learn four ayat. It's better than four Porsches. Porsche example. You can have a house. A million pound mansion house. You want that? This is... The parable that the Prophet ﷺ is giving so that they can understand. We can take another understanding. You can say a mansion, you can say anything. Each ayah is better than any kind of commodity that you can see in the dunya which is the most valued with you. Then the Prophet ﷺ in another hadith, he said that whoever sits. So what we learn from this now here is that obviously the people who go fast and steadfast will run away with those rewards. But Allah Jalla wa ala is not somebody who is unable. Companies and people and banks are limited. Allah Jalla wa ala is prepared to give us, all of us, that multiplication of three million each. Easy. Recite an ayah. On top of that you can get more riches. And Allah with him is all bounty. Prophet ﷺ in his last three hadith in his introduction said, Whoever sits in a, in a gathering, لم يذكروا الله فيه, they don't remember Allah in it, كانت عليه من الله ترح, except that it will be a form of humiliation and regret for them. And there's no person who lies down and, and lies down and goes to sleep or lies down on his bed, except that he doesn't remember Allah, except that it will be a humiliation and a regret for him. Sitting, and lying down. Remember Allah or regret. That's the nutshell. He also said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, مَا جَلَسَ قَوْمٌ مَجْلِسٌ لَمْ يَذْكُرُوا اللَّهُ فِي There's not a people that sit and don't remember Allah. وَلَمْ يُسَلُّوا عَلَى نَبِيهِمْ And they don't say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and mention his name, Alayhi Salam, إِلَّا كَانَ عَلَيْهِمْ تِرَّا Except that it's going to be a humiliation and a cause of regret for them. And Allah Jalla wa ala said, Allah Jalla wa ala, on your mukim, for insha adhabahum wa insha ghafara lahum. Except that Allah, maybe He will be merciful to them, or it's possible that Allah forgives them or punishes them. So think about that, my brothers. How many sittings do we have? How many WhatsApp conversations do we have? How many conversations that we have generally? We and. How much khair do we get from it? I mean, like we said before, you don't have to be saying Allah's name all the time. Zikr could be internal. You could advise people. You could be speaking to a person who's not Muslim and advising them and teaching them about the beauty of Islam. This would be a form of dhikr for you. And the last hadith here in this introduction, ma min min majlis. There's no group that stand up from a sitting that they've had that they haven't remembered Allah in it. إِلَّا قَامُوا أَنْ مِثْلِ جِيْفَةِ جِيْفَةِ Himar, Except that they have stood up 
like uh, with a donkey's carcass. And for them, and it's going to be a form of humiliation and regret for them. It shows you that the only people who have the tawfiq to have dhikr will be given. And that dhikr beautifies your actions, it beautifies yourself, it beautifies your friendships and your circles. But here I just want to end with some of these benefits of sittings. And Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, in the book that we mentioned earlier, Wab al-Sayyib, he has over 100 benefits as to the dhikr of Allah in the introduction of his book. And it's not just 100, he has more, but he's limited it just to 100 reasons why you should and virtues. And here, in a few of them here, together he has mentioned why you should mention Allah in your gatherings. So he said number 18, that remembering Allah will... Create uh, your heart to be opened. And it will create your heart to become softened. Remembering Allah will remove from you an, a sin. You remember Allah, somebody advises you to remember Allah, you might go away and think, you know, I'm not going to do that anymore. Remembering Allah will take away that animalistic desire and attitude in your behavior, in your wants, in your needs that you have. And that creates a strong connection between Abdu and between Rabbi. Creates a strong connection between his Lord. There is not a servant that remembers Allah Jalla wa Ala and makes tasbih and tamheez. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah. And he reminds his friends and the people around him to do so, except that it will create them in a stronger bond. A servant remembers Allah Jalla wa ala in ease, in his easy gatherings. Allah will remember them when he is in his difficult need. You ring your friend, how are you? Everything okay? How's your family? Let's remember Allah, let's do something good. <laughs> Next time he rings you, you know what? It's not a very good situation. This is happening in my life and that's happening in my life. That conversation and that, that relationship you've had before will make your relationship of difficulty easy. Allah will save you from his punishment if you remember him. Allah will make tranquility fall upon your gatherings. Not just in the masjid, outside, in your homes. Rahmah will surround you. And the malaika will come and they will place their wings on top of your heads. This is dhikr. Why should you remember Allah in your gatherings? Is because when you remember Allah in your gatherings, it protects you from ghiba and namima and lying and being irresponsible with your tongue. Why should you remember Allah in your gatherings? Because if you remember Allah in your gatherings, the angels around you will remember you in their gatherings. <coughs> and when the angels remember you in their gatherings, there will be remembering of dua, and supplication for you. And what it will prevent for you, Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah said, When you don't remember Allah, then what you end up doing is you start wasting time. Start talking about things which won't benefit you at all. Sometimes you might even end up start talking about haram. Things don't benefit, things which are haram. Entertainment, sports, giba and namim. These are the majalis of shaitan. So either you let the angels come and sit with you, or you let the shayateen infiltrate. Why should you remember Allah in your gatherings? Because it will make your gatherings a gathering of beauty and remembrance. As in, you will remember. Uh, yeah, I benefited. This was good. This was khayr. Gatherings that don't remember Allah, you'll only remember it for bad. And it will be a cause of humiliation and regret, like these hadith say. Why should you remember Allah? Because on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, you will be asked about all of your gatherings. Did you sit with that person on that day? You will not be able to say no. That day, that time, for that period, everything is recorded. And if you don't, it's going to be a cause of regret and humiliation. Why should you remember Allah in your gatherings? Because when you remember Allah in your gatherings, when you are alone, you are able to repent and weep, and cry, and seek Allah's 
shade under his arsh when you are alone. Why should you remember Allah in your gathering? You should remember Allah because Allah has given you the ability to benefit other people more than a person coming and asking you for money. And the last one, why should you remember of Allah? Because it's the easiest thing that you could do. It's actually easier than you thinking of trying to say th- something. Or trying to fight shaitan and he comes to you and says, say this about the person and you don't want to say it. It's just easier for you to remember Allah and spread goodness. And bi'ithnillah next week we will begin some of the athqar which talk about the morning athqar and, and so forth. I ask Allah to make this beneficial for us all and the shaykh himself also. And give us the ability to remember him a great deal in our actions, in our statements, in our internal and our external. Hadha wallahu a'lam wa sallallahumma ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Got a question? Yeah. If you are going to, is it better for you to read the Quran in your own language or the Quran in Arabic? If you understand it, it's better for you to read in English, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't read it in Arabic. You will be rewarded with a separate reward for reading it in English, but those multiply rewards of ten is only applicable to the Arabic. So what you need to do is balance between both. And one of the best ways of learning Arabic and the best way of memorizing the Qur'an and gaining an attachment with it is if a person reads the Arabic and then he reads the English alongside it or any language that they understand. Because in that manner they are able to understand what they have read and they are able to pick up vocabulary, they are able to pick up many different benefits. So I would say that the best way of doing that is read some Arabic alongside with the English, then you will have... Attained both rewards. Barakallah. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Shalla ilaha ilaha. Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilaha.